Welcome to all those who have joined already for this webinar. Uh, thank you for tuning in on, uh, on this interview. And I hope it will be a very beneficial time for all of us. Uh, the coming minutes, we will be learning from Dr. Wayne Grudem. Now, he is a famous figure in evangelicalism and for all the right reasons. He has he is not been caught up in any scandals, but he is well known because he has been for many years a clear voice for the importance of what the Bible says in all areas of life. He did his doctorate years ago in Cambridge, and he submitted his doctoral dissertation on the 9th of November, 1976. And he, he did his doctorate, I believe, under Professor Mole, or Charlie Mole, as he is normally known. And the topic was the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. Now, already in his doctoral thesis so many years ago, the method of reading the Bible that would be so characteristic in many of Wayne's books was clear. He collects all the biblical data and rigorously categorizes and unifies, unifies the various verses that deal with the matter and then comes to a conclusion what scripture is teaching. Now, after he'd finished his doctorate, um, Wayne fairly soon started to work on a systematic theology, which is very different from most of the systematic theologies that are produced nowadays. And what makes uh, Wayne's systematic theology so useful is that for every topic, the biblical material is laid out and on the basis of these verses, Wayne reaches his conclusions. Wayne does not start with the history of theology or with philosophical discussions. He is not so much interacting with other theologians from the present or the past. First and foremost, he is reflecting on the biblical data. Now, among the 20 something books that Wayne has written, there are books on politics, on business, ethics, and Bible translation. Now, how we are going to structure this interview is as follows. First, I will ask some of the questions that many of us would probably want to ask anyway. And we will do that for sort of 40, 45 minutes. And we'll concentrate on the topic of you know, being faithful and being a disciple while doing academic work, work for the church and any other work in the kingdom. Then we will have a short break of about five minutes just to catch our breath uh, back, etc., which will give you time to put questions in the chat. And then we will ask those questions to, to Wayne for another 40 or 45 minutes. Now, Wayne, in the introduction, I described your method as first gathering all the biblical data and then ca categorizing, systematizing them in order to uh, formulate a biblical view. Now, regardless whether the topic is prophecy in the New Testament or questions of systematic theology or ethics, um, could you give us a more nuanced description of your approach rather than the broad brush method I used now. Well, Dirk, it's good to be with you and good to see you face to face, even if it's by uh, internet connection. Um, I want to be clear that it isn't as if I started afresh with no knowledge of the history of theology. Um, before I started to write that systematic theology, I had been teaching from and had read, or had read uh, Calvin, uh, Bavinck, Burkhoff, uh, Machen, John Murray from Westminster Seminary, a number of other theologians, in, especially in the Reformed tradition. 
and had been teaching from Burkhoff's Systematic Theology for a number of years. Charles Hodge was a text used in seminary. Um, and then these authors had themselves been influenced by prior generations of theologians and, and those generations by prior church history. So that uh, the influences on me were influences from the entire history of the church. But I didn't find that that was the most helpful way to teach students theology because what they wanted to know was what was behind all of this, what was behind the writings of Hodge or Burkhoff or Calvin. What was behind the, the writings was reflection, re mature reflection on scripture. And I wanted to go back and in many cases use the primary verses that have been used for centuries to teach the doctrine of the deity of Christ or the doctrine of the Trinity or the doctrine of substitutionary atonement or justification or what, what have you. I wanted to use those verses because that was the primary source. That was the sole absolute authority that anyone was using to get to these doctrines. So it isn't as if I sat down with a blank piece of paper and a Bible and said, now, what does the Bible say about justification? I already had Burkhoff, Calvin, Hodge, uh, Murray, um, and others in my, uh, in my pre previous experience, but I didn't un unpack the whole history of, history of thought of those, uh, in those doctrines. I don't know if that's helpful. That's very helpful. Okay. Um, now, of your systematic theology, thousands and thousands of copies have been sold and, and many uh, Bible teaching places use your uh, systematic theology. Were you surprised by its success? Yes. <laughs> um, my academic dean at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School when I was working on this systematic theology my academic dean, Walt Kaiser, was my immediate supervisor. And he said, Wayne, I'm glad you're doing this, but I don't think anyone will buy it because the uh, reformed people won't like your openness to miraculous spiritual gifts. And the charismatic people won't like your Calvinism. So he can't think of anybody who's going to use the book. <laughs> um, but I was surprised by it. Um, we were in a prayer group uh, with our church and um, the group included a seminary student, a very good student, and his wife. And during prayer time, one time when they were praying for me and finishing up the systematic theology manuscript to send to the publisher, um, the student said when we were praying, he had in his mind a, a picture of Professor Mole's idiom book of New Testament Greek, which is widely influential. And he said, I wonder if your systematic theology will not be as influential as Professor Mole's idiom book of New Testament Greek. And uh, in retrospect, it seems as if the Lord was in that picture and that, of course, he was my supervisor and widely respected in, because of that publication. And um, the Lord did bring blessing to it. I was, uh, I was surprised and thankful. What do you think explains the tremendous take up of this systematic theology? Is it in part sort of the method you used of first and foremost engaging again with scripture rather than with the tradition? Or what, what, what do you think is the... Um, two or three things. I had been teaching for several years from Louis Burkhoff's excellent systematic theology, but I realized that when he went to demonstrate where in scripture the evidence for such a do for certain doctrine was found, he would just give the Bible reference like Numbers 23, 15, uh, Psalm 32, 4, uh, Acts 8, 17, uh, Romans 2, 32, and he wouldn't quote the verses. And I knew from teaching experience, I would look up all those verses the night before and make notes in the margin, but students were not going to take the time to do that. Therefore, the very words of scripture that should be persuading this reader 
about the doctrine under consideration. The very words of scripture were lost to the student. They have no idea what Numbers 32.4 means or says. Uh, nor does anyone in the world have the knowledge of scripture that by giving a verse reference, you can always tell what the verse is. So I decided in writing, well, in teaching first in the classroom and then in writing that I would write out the verse. Uh, and, and so the words of the scripture themselves are in the text. And those words have more power than any human words because they're the words of God and they speak to our minds and speak to our hearts and they change our minds and change our hearts. And so the actual words of scripture are in the text. Now, in the process of doing this, I had an interaction with Stan Gundry at Zondervan who has worked at, as a, the American editor. It was published primarily by InterVarsity Press in the UK, but Stan Gundry was dealing with the book in the American uh, market. And he said, Wayne, it's so long, it's so long, it's way too long. We don't want to split it into two volumes um, because uh, it, we've, our experiences, two volume works do not sell very well. And so he said, can you shorten it? Can you take out some of the scripture quotations? And I said, no, Stan, I don't want to take out those quotations because I want people to have the very words of God in front of them because that's what will change minds and hearts and, uh, and teach effectively. And so he said, well, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know if we can publish a book this long in one volume. And so I, I talked to another publisher, well, it was Crossway Books. And Lane Dennis, the president of Crossway said, well, if Zondervan doesn't want it, we'll take it. And when I went back to Stan Gundry at Zondervan and said, well, if you don't want the book, Crossway will take it. And he said, all right, we'll leave the Bible verses in. <laughs> <laughs> we'll publish it with this link. So that's one thing that, that the actual words of scripture are in the text. Another thing is, uh, though Burkhoff was an excellent book, erudite and extensively documented, um, there was no application to life explicitly made. Uh, and I thought, if you look at the New Testament, the, the heavenly theological books, Romans, Ephesians, Hebrews, uh, they have immense application to life. Uh, Romans, Hebrews, uh, Ephesians, there's a lot of material with application to life. And I thought, if the apostles don't feel comfortable teaching doctrine without applying it to life, then why should we teach doctrine without applying it to life? So I put questions for personal application and a hymn at the end of each chapter. The third thing was um, clarity of language. I found with students reading Burkhoff, they confronted untranslated Greek, Hebrew, Latin, uh, German, French, maybe occasional Dutch, I'm not sure, um, because of the great Dutch theologian, theology, theological history, just threw that in for you, Dirk. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and in addition, uh, English vocabulary that was uh, very difficult for students to understand if they had no background in theology. And I thought, this is not helpful. Why write a book that people can't understand without a dictionary? And so I tried to write it in ordinary English without assuming any knowledge of theological special terms unless I would explain them. So the three things, it, it's uh, quoting scripture, it's application to life, and uh, it's an attempt to be clear and understandable. I, I pictured speaking to an audience of first year seminary or theology students uh, with my mother and father in the background, in the back of the room listening, and I wanted them to be able to understand as well. And that was my hypothetical audience. They didn't have any special training in theology, but they, they'd been Christians for their entire life. Uh, so that was the audience I was aiming at. Now, I'm glad you did it this way because thousands and thousands of people have, um, through your work, you know, kind of gone back to scripture and engaged with the text of scripture. And I think that must be so, so satisfying to see that happening as the result of something you have been writing. Now, your PhD was in New Testament. Yeah. And you're, you're trained as a New Testament scholar, but 
in most of the books you have written since then, well, among them, it, there is only one commentary on a book in the New Testament. You only have a commentary of one Peter. So two questions. Why did you write only one commentary and why on one Peter? Why on First Peter? Because InterVarsity Press in the UK invited me to write on First Peter and I hadn't published any other books prior to that, <laughs> except my dissertation. It was a marvelous experience working on First Peter at Tyndall House in Cambridge. Uh, yeah, we're not going to talk about Tindo House too much because otherwise it becomes sort of an advert for, for our common passion and common love as well. Um, I have more question now about your role as theologian. Um, no, uh, J.I. Packer, Jim Packer, once described theologians as a wastewater treatment plant you know, to filter away the rubbish and allow God's people to drink pure water. Um, do you view your role in this way? And if so, how? Or would you choose another metaphor, perhaps? <laughs> well, Dirk, I, I've been called a lot of names, but <laughs> <laughs> no one has ever call, called me a wastewater treatment plant. Well, if Jim Packers does, perhaps there is some. Uh... Yeah, I have great respect for him and miss him as a friend. Um, I would prefer the metaphors that are used in scripture where Paul writes to Timothy and compares him to a, a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, um, or the biblical term uh, shepherd, uh, or shepherd or pastor. I mean, yeah, I, a theology professor is like a farmer who brings forth nourishing fruit and vegetables, nourishing food for, for his hearers. In a that, moment, we are going to talk about the pest control aspect of okay. farming. Uh, well, there is some, there's some truth in this wastewater treatment plan metaphor, as long as it's not the only one used. Um, because uh, there are times when there is harmful teaching in the church. One of the key verses in my life, influential verses, has been 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 12, 12, where Paul says, since you are eager for spiritual gifts, strive to excel in building up the church. And um, that's been a desire of my heart, to excel in building up the church. That's a so, carpenter or a house builder, I guess, another metaphor. Now, in all this, in this quite often very visible frontline work of sticking your neck out and being radically biblically shaped in opinions and perhaps even sometimes calling out, uh, calling out false teaching within the church, how do you remain spiritual vital? when you are studying you know, theology and Bible, biblical theology as a career, how, how do you remain fresh and alive as a believer? Well, there are a number of ways to answer that, Dirk. The first thing that comes to mind is that I have had a habit for my entire adult lifetime of spending time reading the Bible and praying privately in the morning before my work begins. Um, this morning I read Isaiah 43 and Acts 8 uh, and spending time in the Lord's presence and I had a, a surprising and somewhat troubling experience once during the weeks we were meeting and working on the ESV Bible in Cambridge um, day after day and the days became long and I became tired. And I thought, I'm spending eight hours or more per day with 11 other godly scholars talking about the Greek and Hebrew texts of the Bible and how to best translate these verses into English. Why do I need to get up early and spend time reading the Bible privately and praying myself? Why don't I set the alarm clock 30 minutes later and get a little more sleep because I'm getting so tired? So I did that and I skipped the morning devotion time, morning Bible reading and prayer time. And um, 
this was a number of years ago, but after three or four days, I noticed that things were not right in my life. My heart was unsettled. My relationships with friends were becoming difficult. I was inwardly, secretly hoping that people would praise me or speak highly of me in a, in a sermon or in a comment in the translation committee. Um, my heart was restless and uh, I had a hard time pr praying and hard time focusing on scripture. And I was uneasy in my spirit and there was no peace in my heart. And uh, Margaret mentioned it and she said there's something wrong way. And I realized that um, I'd been neglecting my time with the Lord and there was no substitute for that. Even spending eight or nine hours a day in earnest discussion with other godly scholars about the meaning of the biblical text did not substitute for right, reading the Bible and um, seeking to apply it to my life and seeking to hear God speaking to my own heart each day and spending time in prayer with him each day. And I had to say to Margaret, I'm sorry, this is what's happened. And uh, next day I asked for a minute at the beginning of the translation committee where I had to apologize for my attitude in the last three or four days uh, and say, this is what had happened to me. Um, and it was a lesson from the Lord that I think has proved true in my life that unless I spend time privately in reading scripture and praying, uh, the days just don't go well. Um, other habits that um, have been helpful to me, others may or may not find this helpful, but I, I made a list. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Dirk, um, number one, regular time of Bible reading and prayer each morning. <clears throat> number two, regular participation in a small group of Christians who pray together. Margaret and I have been married for 51 years. I would say for 48 of those years or so, something like that. We've been involved in one small group or another. Just another, we're in a group of five couples now. <clears throat> all, all five couples are at the same age and status and situation in life. We have grown children, but we meet every other week on a Thursday night to read scripture and pray together. Number three, faithful membership in a Bible-believing local church. I've recently had conversations with two prominent Christian leaders, so many, a couple of whose names would be recognizable if I mentioned, and I ask where they're going to church and they haven't yet settled in, in a local church. I'm worried for their spiritual health and I'm worried for their doctrinal faithfulness because uh, the Lord wants us to be regularly involved in a local church. A fourth, a group of prayer partners to whom I send email updates about my work. For about the last 30 years, I've had a group of friends that receive an email prayer memo from me uh, maybe once a month or so. Uh, they're, they know that I'm speaking here at the European Leadership Forum at 6.25 a.m. Phoenix time. Um, and uh, a number of them will be praying for me and for this time for me to remain faithful to the Lord and to, for him to bless my ministry. That's a confidential list of, of friends. It's probably about 130 people on the list now because it's grown over the years. But that list of prayer partners has been very important, I think, in the Lord answering prayer. Time and again, I'll, I'll say, I'll send out a memo about something going on in life or some speaking event or writing project and people will pray. Number five, listening to worship music is very helpful. Number six, small prayers throughout the day. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Number seven, um, it's a, it's a metaphor that Paul uses in 2 Timothy 2, uh, talking about a vessel for noble use. He says, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. In other words, it's like in a large house, you would have fine china, but you'd also have the bucket, the scrub bucket to clean the floor and the plastic dish you put the dog food in. And Paul says uh, there are different kinds of vessels, different kinds of uh, containers, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. And then he applies that to the Christian life and cr to Christian ministry. He says, therefore, he's writing to Timothy, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful for the master of, to the master of the house of the house ready for every good work. I don't want to be 
in the Lord's house. Oh, I want to be in the Lord's house as a vessel for honorable use, but that means cleansing my life from what is dishonorable, not giving into temptation and doing something wrong or saying something wrong or lashing out in anger at someone, um, but we're trying to remain faithful. So um, I'm not perfect at that. No one in this life is going to attain complete freedom from sin, but I've sought to be uh, useful to the Lord and keep my life free from willful conscious disobedience. Um, now, one of the things you mentioned here was that you, know, you ask other people to pray for you. In a sense, it is, it, it's making yourself quite vulnerable as well in the sense of basically admitting that you need the prayer of others because you know, on your own you would be too weak. Already you have mentioned a couple of times that it, it, it seems that you live your life very closely with, with Margaret, your, your, your wife of 51 years. Um, again, there, there is the, the open sort of confession that you need that support. Uh, there's that confession that, you know, the example from the translation committee where, where you forgot about or you know, let slip your personal devotion in the morning. Where have you uh, learned this brutal honesty when it comes to the truth about Wayne Gruden? How have you become so radically sort of honest to yourself? And is that something that comes natural to people? I don't think so, but, but can you unpack that a little bit? Um, the um, teaching of the Bible on truthfulness has been very influential to me. The commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, is uh, in the Ten Commandments as a summary of the requirement not to lie, but to speak truth. And my correcting the number on my, on my years of marriage, for instance, I, I was, I wanted to be, I was trying to calculate in my mind because I wanted to be truthful. And in my academic work, I've tried to be accurate and never misquote something or be dishonest about it. Um, God has a, places a very high value on truth and truthfulness in all of our speech, even in minor details. I um, Yes, I remember uh, one day in Cambridge speaking to um, university students at Eden Baptist Church after the one, one evening, Julian Hardiman, the pastor, had asked me to speak on manhood and womanhood and take question and answer. And I had sent out a prayer memo saying I was going to be doing that. And um, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but I, I sent out a prayer memo saying in answer to prayer, thank you for praying for my time with the Cambridge University under, uh, students about manhood and womanhood. Uh, there were about 50 students there. And Julian Hardiman, who is the pastor and who receives the prayer memo said to me the next day, it was more like 40. I may be remembering the numbers inaccurately, but um, it's something like that. And so I sent out a, co a correction to my prayer memo people saying, I'm sorry, I got the number wrong. Because I wanted to, because I valued truthfulness in, in speech and I want to be truthful in representing the, the uh, teachings of scripture and not misrepresent in any way. Now I've forgotten the question that you asked me. Um where did you learn to become so radically honest toward yourself? And I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, uh, the warning in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? I don't think that is completely true of New Testament believers who have God's law written in our hearts. Um, 
and who have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which we are committed in Romans 6. So our hearts have been changed, but there's still deceitfulness in them, and uh, we need the help of other people. Uh, my goal in uh, teaching and writing has not been to, well, insofar as I know my own heart, it hasn't been to show other people how much I know, but to make clear what the Bible says and to make clear its teachings. And there's a, there's a difference in motive. In that sense, you are taking very serious what the Bible says about mankind as a whole, but you include yourself there. Yeah. You know, the heart of man is deceitful and you, you count that you need, you need to reckon with the fact that you may deceive yourself almost, and that's why you need to stay open to I could mention one other thing. I have an absolutely wonderful, godly wife who prays for me and isn't afraid to speak when she sees something wrong. A number of years ago, um, I had been traveling quite a bit and had enough status on American Airlines that I was frequently upgraded to first class. You never know until you got on the airplane uh, whether there'd be an empty first class seat or not. But I remember once I got on the airplane at O'Hare Airport in Chicago, and um, I was upgraded to first class for free. And I was sitting down in the seat and before the plane took off, I called Margaret and said, well, I'm on the plane and I got upgraded to first class again. And her response was, I hear pride in your voice, Wayne. <laughs> Not I'm happy for you. And I am, I'm thankful to God to have a wonderful wife who speaks the truth. I mean, teenagers can have that same effect. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, you are no stranger to conflict in the sense of publicly taking positions over against other positions in the world of Christianity. Um, I mean, there is the question of why are those theological conflicts necessary? So, and how do you identify and address which fights to pick, which positions to take uh, a, st a stance on publicly, and which ones are not your fight? Yes. To a large degree, Dirk, it depends on a subjective sense of God's leading or God's guiding. Um, in uh, Acts 17, it says, when Paul came into the city of Athens, his spirit was provoked within him because he saw that the city was full of idols. And there's something analogous to that in my own life, where um, when I see people in the evangelical world denying the truthfulness of scripture in various places. It stirs up in me uh, a, a troubled sense that this should not be, this is harmful to God's people. And so I've written quite substantially in the, the Systematic Theology book in defense of biblical inerrancy, that the Bible is completely truthful in all it teaches, all that it affirms. It doesn't affirm anything contrary to fact. And that's been a foundational conviction in my entire life. I want to be faithful to scripture. Acts 20, 26 to 27, Paul visited, Paul was talking with the elders of the church at Ephesus. And uh, he says, um, I, I'm innocent of the blood of all of you because I did not cease, I did not shrink back from teaching the whole counsel of God. And uh, that verse has been, influential in my life, I want at the end of my life to say, I'm innocent of the blood or I'm innocent of the wrongdoing of anyone who I taught because I didn't shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God. I didn't, didn't, didn't stop to proclaim something from scripture or teach something from scripture because it was unpopular or difficult, but I wanted to be faithful to God in what I was teaching. And uh, I've, I've sought to do that. I maybe, maybe have not done it perfectly. I, I'm sure there are mistakes and um, I've, I've, I've taught some things that were not right and realized it, 
I'm sure I've taught some other things that are not right and I haven't realized it yet, but no one is perfect. I just sought to be faithful. Um, at other times there are differences among Christians that don't make much difference and I haven't really put much effort into them. Differences on the, the uh, timing of Christ's return with respect to the millennium and the tribulation that the Bible predicts is coming. Um, I don't think that the differences we have on that make a lot of difference to the other Christian doctrines or the Christian life. But um, teaching about biblical inerrancy does make a difference. I think teaching about um, accuracy in Bible translation is very important because God's word is so important to us. But it is God stirring up my heart. Sometimes the Lord putting me in circumstances where I am almost forced to take a stand on something. Um, I wrote a book on so-called free grace theology a few years ago because it was, I, I came to Phoenix Seminary and it was something that was um, advocated by some other faculty members, member or members, and um, I had to deal with it as honestly as I could and trying to retain the friendship of people with whom I differ. So in that sense, it is very much, well, in part, a firm conviction that you know, scripture is the absolute foundation of yes. truth. Yes. The other hand, there is a sense of personal calling in the sense that yes. you know, you're provoked to speak out. Yes. Something. Yes. And uh, another factor is, are other people working on this as well? Um, I didn't write much of anything except a section. In this. Now I have a second edition of Systematic Theology that came out in December. And I have a section in there on the new perspective on Paul. But prior to that, I didn't write much of anything about it because other people were doing wonderful work. Tom Schreiner, Don Carson, others, John Piper, um, were working in that uh, issue and I didn't think any more was needed. It's the same with um, the open theism con controversy over whether God knows future human choices. Uh, that Bruce Ware and other friends were uh, working on that quite uh, diligently and it just didn't seem like there was need for anyone else to do any more work on it. So uh, partly it's, is, is anyone else writing and teaching about this. Another um, factor is uh, other people's perception of what is needed sometimes make a difference. Um, Margaret and I were in Cambridge a number of years ago and uh, Peter Luce and Faith, his wife, invited us to dinner. Um, he's been active as a, in the European Leadership Forum as well. Many, many people I'm talking to may know him. And Peter said, Wayne, the uh, teaching of theistic evolution is gaining quite influence here in the United Kingdom. And he was troubled about it and thought it was um, not helpful to, for the church. And um, would I uh, edit a book or write a book uh, about theistic evolution? And my response was, I'm sorry, Peter, I have too many other writing commitments. I can't do this. Um, but the problem was Margaret was at dinner with us and we got, got home and she said, Wayne, this is really troubling to me. I think you need to get involved. And um, then Peter Luce found uh, J.P. Moreland and Stephen Meyer and said, will the three of you work together on it? And with that and Margaret's encouragement, I agreed. And the book came out edited by the three of us and Christopher Shaw and Ann Gager as well. And um, I think the Lord has given some favor and blessing to that book. Engaging with our friends who are believers, uh, but who have a different view of evolution and creation and trying to do that respectfully, but firmly. Um, so you talk about now, and I love the terminology you're using. You, you mentioned them as friends who hold oh, a different view on this. Yeah. How difficult is it when it comes to public disagreement to, to remain truly you know, on brotherly and sisterly terms? You know? That it may be an assault on your own 
kind of no purity of thinking and and your feeling but also in practice i can imagine that that those discussions even though you discuss positions rather than individual people that that christian fellowship and uh, that sense of you no know, fighting for the, for the same cause ultimately is is fraught with danger well paul says at the end of romans uh, insofar as possible live peacefully with everyone and so far as it lies with you that is if, uh, we need to do what is appropriate and necessary on our part even though others may have a different approach sometimes it's not possible and um, probably the most difficult situation dirk was uh, controversy over gender language in bible translation where the niv was incorporating uh, a number of changes um, three three thousand some changes with regard to uh, translating man father son brother and he him and his and i wrote uh, fairly extensively saying that uh, some changes are necessary where the original Greek or Hebrew text doesn't imply a male human being, but where the original text would make the reader think a male human being is being referred to, we shouldn't obliterate that gender specific language and translating into English. And uh, that was criticizing the NIV, which is the most, which was the most uh, popular Bible version at the time. Not only that, but at least half of the NIV translation committee were personal friends. Um, and that was hard. And um, as a result of that, uh, some friendships were damaged and that damage has never been repaired fully. Um, we just had difference of opinion. Now, and I have to say um, that uh, the people at Zondervan who published the NIV, uh, Stan Gundry and others, throughout this controversy where I was criticizing their Bible translation, uh, they acted in Christian charity and kindness and uh, graciousness throughout the controversy. And I'm thankful for that because it could have been more acrimonious. But it was where I felt God calling me to take a stand on accuracy in translation. And um, others thought they weren't sacrificing accuracy or they were not, not in any significant way. And I thought they were. Um, and so that was hard, but I thought that God wanted me to write about this and seek to, and it was to my mind an issue of whether I would be faithful to, uh, to what I understood to be the teaching of his word and accuracy in translation. But that, that was, there was a price to pay in terms of relationships. Now, one final question before we take our uh, little break. Um, you have been involved with Europe, with the continent of Europe, for almost 50 years now. You, you, you started doing your, your PhD in, in England. You, over the last years, you have been a very faithful friend of the European Leadership Forum. In between, you have uh, taught and traveled to Europe. Um, so, as an, somebody from North America, um, who has a real interest in spiritual development and theology, etc. Um, what is, in your view, the number one theological challenge that we here in Europe are facing today? It's hard to pick out only one issue. And the issues that people face in Europe are issues people face in the United States as well. Uh, Perhaps we're five or 10 years behind Europe, but the controversies are very similar. Um, certainly Bible, the Bible's teaching on sexual morality and gender uh, and uh, the idea of sexual morality with uh, the Bible's teaching on sexual intercourse being appropriate only within the bounds of a man and a woman married to each other. That's certainly under challenge in the, in the, in the society and it's a challenge to the church. And the challenge will become more difficult if laws are passed prohibiting uh, discrimination against homosexuals or trans, uh, transsexual persons who identify a male who identifies as a woman or a woman who identifies as a man. 
and um, whether we the the uh, the anti-Christian movement in society is an attempt to use the force of law to force Christians to affirm the moral validity of these uh, patterns of life that are contrary to God's moral teachings in scripture. And we'll have a challenge of conscience in that way. Um, I've seen in the last year uh, a rise in the importance of uh, accusations of white supremacy and racism and uh, critical race theory. Um, and I've been reading somewhat about that recently. That's going to be increasingly a challenge for us to deal with appropriately in the church. Uh, behind all of that is a uh, more uh, fundamental question. And that is, again, the truthfulness of the Bible and the authority of the Bible. Is it truthful in all it says? Is it morally right in all that it teaches or not? And will we stand firm uh, for the uh, complete authority of scripture or will we compromise on that? Complicating that, Dirk, as you are very much aware, um, complicating that is the fact that in the modern university setting, people who teach the Bible many, many times view it as merely human words and human writings, not as the word of God, as well as human. Uh, and evangelicals, as evangelicals, we view the Bible as certainly human writings, but also at the same time, the very words of God and with absolute authority and absolute truthfulness. And sometimes there's a temptation on the part of evangelicals to think that if they, to think that if they're going to be good scholars and respected, they have to go along with people, the ideas of people who think the Bible is only human words and can have contradictions and inconsistencies in it. Um, but I think we have to realize that these people are coming from a different perspective. They're viewing the Bible as merely the products of human inventiveness and perhaps a genuine encounter with God, but not the very words that have been breathed out by God. Uh, and, um, there's a temptation to think that good scholarship is that which doesn't treat the Bible as the word of God. But I think that's covering up half of the truth. Um, it is human writings, yes, uh, and influenced by human personality and circumstance, but also I believe the very words that God wanted it to be and the very words of God to us.